Good afternoon. This is Julie Bloomquist, and I'm with the virtual chapter of Database Administration. Today we're going to have a lecture by Jean Joseph. It's Advanced Tips and Tricks for the DBAs and Developers. Our meetings are sponsored by Dell Software. We have some upcoming SQL Saturdays, both in North America and International. Uh, they're posted here. You can always visit uh, the www.sqlsaturday.com and uh, look for events near you. This is a one-day uh, free seminar. Usually there's a minimal speed for the lunch, but it's a, a mini one-day conference. March 2nd to the 4th is the SQL Rally over in Copenhagen, Denmark. If you are uh, planning on attending, you could save 5% off with the past chapter's 5 uh, registration code. Don't forget that the Business Analytics Conference is coming up April 20th to the 22nd in Santa Clara. The virtual chapter is going to be able to give you $150 off the registration here if you use the BAVCDB uh, code during your registration time. Whatever your passion, there is a virtual chapter for you. So we have quite an extensive list of virtual chapters. Just go to your uh, pass log in and associate yourself with the different virtual chapters. You'll get emails on uh, with the links to their meetings. And most of the virtual chapters do record the presentations. Ours is being recorded today and it will be going over to our archive page uh, once the recording is uploaded. So you could always go to our website and view past uh, lectures. Here's a select list of virtual chapters with uh, meetings which are coming up in February. If you're interested in volunteering with PASS, there's quite a few uh, options. Just go to my volunteering section of your PASS profile. You can also submit to recognize outstanding volunteers and uh, nominate people for the Passion Award. Once again, here's the information about how to stay involved with PASS. Today's lecture is going to be presented by Jean Joseph. Uh, he's got a wealth of experience working as a DBA and a developer, and he's gained his experience from performance tuning database and index design, managing storage, fixing production issues, database migration, disaster recovery, scripting, working with the T-SQL, PL-SQL, VBNets, C-Sharp, PowerShell, etc. Uh, we did have a miscommunication with John about the time of this lecture, and he has not yet joined the presentation, so there will be a slight delay in the starting of uh, the lecture for this. So stand by, and uh, Jean should be on shortly. Uh, if not, we will let you know, and then we will uh, reschedule. Hello? Hi, Jan. Are you able to see my screen? Uh, yes, we see the Daisy Jean, and uh, I've already done the uh, presentation, the introduction, so you can okay. get right started with your presentation. Okay, thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Jean Joseph. I'm a SQL Server DBA. Below uh, my contact info, you can email me at ccohelper at gmail.com. Also, this is my blog. Um, I just rewrite it. I don't, I don't really load all my articles back to that blog, but anyway, 
at the end of uh, this month, I think this should be done. Um, uh, this is a little bit about me. I'm a full-time employee and independent consultant CBA. If you or your company do need help on any mention below, please contact us. We are four professional uh, ZBAs developers. Join ourselves together to do part time when it comes to consultant. We do remote DBA services. Uh, we set up and manage uh, database mirroring, application, log application, log shipping, performance tuning, hardware and configuration problems. We okay and we good. When it comes to that, we we expect on uh, query tuning, patches and service pack, uh, health check, uh, upgrades and migration, uh, backup and recovery, exercise tuning and data warehouse. Uh, in case if you do need uh, any help uh, when it uh, comes to one of uh, those mentioned, you can please uh, contact us uh, at tcohelp at gmail.com. So enough about me, let me go to the topic today. I will be talking about advanced state and traits so for DBAs and developers. I mean, you know, as a production DBA, I mean, my tips will most likely be based on real issue. If your data gets delayed, drop it, or updated, you know, I will talking. I will be talking about documentations. We'll be talking about some settings that you have to be able, right? And then uh, basically these are the elements uh, that I will focus most for these sessions. Like I already said, documentation, I will show you how you can know or identify who issue any data, update, chunk it, and job statement. I will talk about application design because uh, most of the time, uh, um, you may have a good uh, database, uh, uh, a, a good physical database design, and then if your logical database design is not good enough, you want can performance, it's, it's vice versa. And then also I will be talking about coding, some servers and resource governor best practices because this is a feature a lot of people don't really want to use it or they probably don't know exactly how to set it up or the benefit they can have by configure resource governor. Okay, um, uh, when it comes to documentation, this is a big topic. Me as a part-time consultant or whenever I change job, I normally, especially when I change job, so I have time to document things because of the two first or three weeks or your first month, they don't really assign work to you. All you have to do is learn the process and I normally use this time to document. The reason why document is so important is that you uh, take it as a DBA or developer, right? It, it's, it's impossible to remember everything that you modify. That's, that's the reason why I start with documentation. There's a, there's a SP configure, which uh, replaces Shifas area. Uh, we used to have in SQL Server 2005. This SP is very useful. And you can uh, change uh, any type of uh, options without reporting the server. And then uh, normally I always uh, do a backup uh, of this uh, value. Or if you're not okay the way yes, we configure this the data, you can use a sys configuration, which will give you the same uh, type of information. Facet is something, let, let me quick go ahead and show you. Facet is something like that, that will give you the same information, but different uh, it will break it down. Let's say, for, for example, um, if I want to see Shifas area, right? A lot of people say Microsoft doesn't support it, and it does. But if you, if you go here, 
this is your superstar area. People who have experience in 2005, they know exactly what I'm talking about, right? So, I mean, what I normally do, even though this information is, uh, I, I can get them from SP, right? Or uh, from SP configure or CISO configurations. Like, uh, if I just join, I can quickly see oh, the server that they just gave me access, I, I can quickly see exactly how the server. I can have information yeah, about this server audit, the server itself. I mean, those are the elements that I normally focus on my first day. But I, I don't want to stay so long on that fast sector. Um, one thing also when it comes to documentation that I want to say, I mean, you need to have each environment and set up the same way especially when it comes on to uh, performance tuning where there is a lot of uh, slowness and you know what you can test on their server maybe can work very fast and then, and then once you deploy it the production is different I know it's a little bit costly but if you can do your best to have those four environment identical that would be better um, on my first uh, week, when I start working for any company as a new hire, I always, uh, for example, get a list of the server and then put them into an Excel sheet and then let my boss uh, tell me exactly which one is a part of this environment, which one is there, which one is IT, which one is UAT, and then which one is production. But when it comes to security, as you already know, dev always belong to developer. They should have 100% uh, access. But you cannot give developer any DML, uh, DDL access to IT because IT for, um, uh, for DBA or manager is like a production. Because uh, if you give developer access to IT tests, what happens, it will be hard for you to keep track of release versioning. I mean, like, there are some companies that I used to work with. If there's any release, they may call it release 1, release 2, release 1.5 or 2.5. I mean, this is where it's coming from. If there's any mistake, you have to send it back to them. Dev will fix it, then you will bring it back to IT test. But if the IT tests are uh, validate all the release, so they're okay to push it to UAT. So this is where you can uh, remove all the permission from your manager because UAT is a pre-production for our user most of the time. So once they validate it, you, you, you're gonna push it to production, if any mistake happens, you have to bring it back again to uh, the development. I mean, that's the reason why before you do like uh, any patches, any release, any changes on top of your server or database setting, it would be better to document it. And then when it comes to disaster recovery plan, you, you have to document it now. So the main reason is that uh, if you don't have a good documentation for your disaster recovery plan, it will be tough for you. Because if something won't happen, most of people, they believe on the backup file, they believe on the high availability group, which is uh, um, sometimes uh, they set up always on uh, clustering or uh, log shipping to see, for example, if they can uh, get themselves ready for any disaster recovery. But remember, um, when you set up a log shipping or mirroring, this is not really a disaster recovery plan because uh, if someone issue any delay on top of the source, like let's say on top of your principal database, it is gonna go and replicate to your secondary database. That's the reason why, for example, um, when you when you set up a disaster recovery, you cannot really think about like uh, only HA. 
because there are some other things uh, that you need to pay attention like uh, let me go this way you have to add some details when I say details you need to look for any vendor hardware vendor that are very close or near to your company because uh, if anything happen and then this is the time that you will be looking for new new vendors where you can buy this hard drive where you can do this uh, this will be time consuming and you you don't want that and then also you have to know with over time your server will be changed so any modification have to be documented and then also you need to write uh, your documentation your disaster recovery plan in a way where anybody should be able to read it i don't need to be a dba or a developer dba to be able to read it anybody any it guy even my boss should be able to read it and uh, follow the instructions and then also you have to test your uh, your recovery plan sometimes uh, every six months or every year in case if something will happen and then uh, you have to review your test um, uh, I don't want to stay too much uh, about that documentation but let me move on instead uh, to a demo this way you can see exactly what I'm talking about. Let's say, for example, if I join a company, like I said, and then they're telling me, okay, learn the process and everything. This is my trick, or if I go and working as a consultant, this is normally how I start. So I have this script, right? What I normally do, in case if uh, XP CMD shell is not on, what I normally did do, I, I have this on. When I have this on, if you look at this, I just, in case if it's not on, it will turn it on. And then I, want, uh, I just want to create the test table and I will dump all those information. When I dump those information, right? Okay, let me do some massage on top of that table. I see that I have three servers, and if you can look at, look at it, I have three servers. The reason why I have, uh, I, I have it this way, I need to know, for example, which server is there so I can pay its attention. Like, uh, no, like the type is more about is it OLCP or OLAP, but for the environment, I, I need to know for example, if it's a dev or if it's a user test or if it's a IT test or production. And I need to know the machine name. Sometimes for security purpose, they rename the instance name. And, I, and sometimes you, you probably try to log in remotely and think, okay, the default one should use or the machine name. Sometimes they just rename it. And I need to know, and I need to know which department uses it, which team is in charge, and I need to have some descriptions. The reason why I done it this way is that sometimes it's, uh, people hide the connection. Let me show you something. If you go and then you try to browse the network from uh, your SQL Server configuration tools, you can go and hide it where people won't be able to see it from your network. I will not be able to see it if I hide it here, but sometimes that's what they do. And then even though if you hide it here, it's true I will not be able to see it, but if I want my query, it will go and extract all the server name that is part of a specific domain okay and then also as i know all the server name i can go and check to see if there is uh, any other options turn on like cdc let me change this to um, sql mode scanzi mode i can change this right i can 
check to see if there is any CDC turn on. If you look at this, I can say, okay, this server have a, a, a CDC database is turned on. This is the database then. This is the database ID and uh, a CDC enable is true. And then I can see which table. I can go and do my documentation. So with this, it will be much easier for you to understand any big environment uh, very, very easy. Um, as the time is uh, it's a little bit too much, I don't want to uh, spend much of the time on top of this. So let me move on. Let's say, for example, um, uh, you have uh, an email. Somebody say, listen, there is some um, delay, uh, some update. Uh, happening. I just load uh, 20 records, so now I'm seeing 10. Most of the time I see people there, they're having a lot of problems, right? They don't really follow their own method to find out. I mean, when something won't happen, it would be better to look for the root cause instead of try to fix it first, then you're not even able to uh, know exactly what's going on because sometimes it requires you to restart your server. Me, the way I normally troubleshoot, this is my trick and I'm, and I'm ready to sh share it with you guys. Um, let's say, for example, if there is any, uh, let me log in, let me create this user. So this way you can understand me better. Okay. Um, this is exist. Let me jog in. Okay. So now let me connect as. Um, let me connect as. Uh, um. See that. Let me connect to a different server instead because I don't want to reboot this server. Okay. Okay, I log in as delay. Okay, so now let me create a database to give you that uh, to show to demo that delay statement. Okay, let me create a table. Let me insert some data. So now I just insert some data. Let me take a look at. This so I have 40 records, right? Let's say, for example, we there is an ETL process that go and push data to that table, and then what? What uh, after that process is done, someone by mistake issue a delete statement twice, and I want you to pay attention. So now I don't have. Uh, no more for the records, I have only 20. So what I normally see, if, if this is based on your database recovery, if your database recovery is a full, this method will help you so much. But if your database recovery mode is in sample, if you set it up in sample, to be honest with you, this will help you to find out who but it's not going to help you to find out exactly the time to stop to, to, to do your restore and then stop at a specific time. Okay, let's say if I receive an email, they said, you know what, 
um, uh, the, I just saw insert uh, 40 records, so now I'm seeing 20. And then because of that, my application is failing. What I normally do, I always go and see if someone issue any delete statement. Because I, no one will tell you that they did it, especially junior DBA or developer. They, they will not admit it. So as I see I have a delete statement, I notice should cache. Okay, and the person report it was 40 records, so now I'm seeing 20. So what I will do, I will create query, DM exec uh, query start and then text and I need to know exactly how many times uh, this one execute. I can quickly see. If you look at this, she said that was, for example, it was 40 records and then now it's 20. I can see that delete statement execute twice. So that's mean um, she was right. It was 40 records and I know the time. When I say the time, this means so much for me. Like I just said, but this is based on your recovery plan. Right here, I can see exactly to, uh, I can do a tell, tell uh, log back up and then I can restore my log and then start it before that transaction. Okay? And then now I still don't know who exactly issued that delete statement, but I have to go deeper and deeper. But sometimes I compare those two times before I, I set up my restore. If you look at that delete statement, it's uh, the time match. So that's when this is the exact time that I have uh, to stop at my list of process. And then if you go, uh, so now we still don't know exactly who delayed it, but we are 100% sure someone just issued a delete statement. And we know the time, we know how many times, and then now I'm going to look to see exactly who delayed it. So if you look at these transactions, I'm going to go to the DB log, and then I'm going to look at for this object. You see this object? And then if you go, this should be your 20 records. And then if you want, I can even add the log sequence number, right? So this, these are your 20 records. You're, they're still there, but this is useful if it's full. If it's simple, I, mean, I don't know if there's a way you can recover it unless you it back up, right? But let's still find out. So I, I'm going to copy this, copy this, and then I'm going to use this here. When I use it here, all I need is to get this transaction seed ID. When I get the transaction seed ID, and I can paste it here and see exactly who issued that delete statement. If you look at, I log in as a, as a delete statement and, right, and this is it. And I, quickly I can see exactly, okay, so and so did delete uh, something, okay. So it's the same thing for update. Update is a little bit different. Let let me um, create a login and call it update. And let me log in as update. So now let me create a table. Let me put some data to that table. Okay, let me update that table. Okay, so right now the value change. If someone say, okay, that was not the value, 
the value was named, it was not SQL pass. Because when, when you create this information, it was the database name, right? So it was not SQL pass. So what, what will I do? Normally, I always follow the same steps. Look to see if there's anything from cash. But remember, if you're working with people that is very smart, they can clear your cash. Right? You can still, I mean, if, 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 you, if you don't find any information about that update, you can look for DBCC people cash and see if it's there. Because if, if someone runs it, it, it will cash. But it, it will clear out all your cash information before. So this is the thing that I want you to understand. And if you want, I can demo it for you too. So when you look at this, I'm going to see if there's someone issuing an update. Yes? Okay. Yes? Okay. So now let me find out the time. I know the time and I know how many records. And it was 40. And I know the time as I normally so I said, you know what, let me see, let me make sure if that was the time, if they match. Let me see. Um, okay, sometimes, uh, somehow this one did, did, didn't bring any information. So now I, I can go and, okay. I can go, for example, and look for the time. Where is my, I just saw my update statement, hold on. Okay. Yes, that was the 41, that's perfect, it's uh, okay. So now, if I want to know who exactly updated, so I can quickly go here and create that same DB log. When I create that same DB log, I can see the time here. That was the same time I, I got me over there. And then I can see the transaction still. And I can go and have the current uh, log sequence number. I can what I will do, let me copy that transaction scene. And then uh, I will uh, paste it here and see exactly who issued that update statement. You can see update did it. Update it did it. For example, like I said, if someone clear all your information, you may not see it. But that doesn't mean if you go to DB log, you won't get it. I will show you because job and and uh, chunk it work differently. Let me show it to you. Let me create another user and I will call it job. And then let me connect to that server again and using job user. But what I want you to pay attention is that see what will happen. Let me uh, use this database as it's already there. Let me create this table. Let me insert some data to this table. Okay, so now let me drop this table. When I drop it, let's see what will happen. I cannot see any job statement. Because job, it will not cash. Even though the only way that you can get it if you have a third party process that keeps track of all your transactions or if you have a custom 
program that keep track of that or you can set up extended event also. And then let me see if I use this, will I still be able to find the query? No? There's no there's no job statement. This is where everything is a little bit tricky. Right? So now let me see from DB log if I will be able to see any jobs statement, right? Any object that being job. Now I can see it. I can see there's one object is being job. And if I want, I can look for allocation name, unit name, and I can get that object. But it's it's null in this case. But okay, so I think if I open this, okay, so now I know exactly, I got exactly the transaction ID. This is exactly the person who issued that job statement. If I paste this, and I can go and find out exactly who job this table. So I know, okay, Job user job is stable. Um, Julie, before I go ahead to the chunk and move to the second part, if there's any questions? Hello? Sorry, I was muted. Uh, no, people are just asking about the recording, and then would you be able to share your script as well with us? Yes. So I will be uploading uh, the recording and the script then to the meeting archive on the DBAVC website. So that, yeah. that's it for questions. Okay, no problem. So let's move to Chunky Park. Um, uh, let me copy this here. Chunky. Sorry. Did it? Clean my code. Okay. And then let me log in as chunk it user. Okay. So now let's create this table, this database, we create it all over here. Okay, let's, let's insert some data. We insert data. So now let's issue any chunk and see what will happen. We issue it. So as I said, I always go this way before I reboot or do anything. If you look at chunk there's no cache you didn't log. If you look at, uh, if I want to look for any query that have chunk it on it, there's no chunk it. And then if I want to know the time this one happened, if you remember the time, that's the exact time. This is the last time this table being updated. Okay, what what I normally do, I'm gonna look from the DB log, see if there's any chunk it records. So I got the chunk it records, right? And I got uh, the log sequence number. I got the transaction ID. And I and I have the time it issue. If you compare this time to the time that was reported here, it will be the same. So now I can go to that uh, process and I can quickly get that seed ID and paste it here and paste it here and then and see exactly which of it. Chunk it user job that table. So this is exactly uh, when it comes to production issue, what 
used to be a challenge for me when people say, listen, this table is, was chopped. I said, how come? So my advice to you is that anytime when some, something happened like delayed statement, statement issue or job, chunk it, you cannot quickly go and fix it, right? You have to look and see exactly who did it and why it happened. If there is any application, have this hard code, because if you quickly go and fix it, and I'm telling you the issue is resolved, you, want, you will never spend time to get it done, especially I like when my boss is yelling at me, listen man, I need an answer. That's the time you need to take your time and, and prove to your company there's a lot of access people having on top of your production step that they should never have. Because of that, we are about to lose customers, clients. You understand? So that's the time they will admit, okay, let's remove some permissions. You know, there's a lot of people too that don't really need that much that much permissions. Because if, if, if for somehow when things happen, you just go ahead and fix it, people will never respect your production to be uh, servers. Okay, this is one part. Let me go to the next part. The next part is that sometimes I see people, they go, they create temp table for any small data. Let's say, for example, let me see if I can bring this uh, to you as example. When we look at this, right, let's count this. This is 93 records. Most of the time, people just go and dump it into a temp table, right? And then your production database should, should be clean. So not, normally when, I, when somebody emails me that small thing, instead of having a temp table, I can generate a script using uh, Excel. If you look at this, right, all I have to do is uh, know when to uh, concatenate uh, the, uh, the, the colons. If you look at, I, uh, let me double click on this, it's just the concatenations. And this will generate me the script. Let me do this. And then that's the script. Remember, this is exactly what I have. Instead of having this to my temp, uh, uh, to a temp table and then delay it after, I can have it this way. All I have to do is check this because there's one union all and then I can click. This is exactly the same result. If you look at it, same one. Where you don't really have to use temp table in import, import and then daily your production database. If I, want, I can do it straight, I can do a select everything, form, and I can add this one here. Let me press enter, and then this is changed completely now. So let me do this. And then again, let me check for your syntax. I know this one is not good. And I can do this and check again. Let me see which one is causing the issue. Um, yeah, that's true. Give me one second. Let, let me fix this. Okay. Let me fix this.
Anyway, but you guys see it. It seems like for somehow, and this is a demo. I don't really want to spend much time at the same time. You can create a select everything from this. Okay. Um, uh, let's move on. And then also, what I wanted to talk about is most likely about uh, uh, your physical database design. I mean, for example, um, uh, let me see. This is uh, based on applications. Let me go back to my uh, slide. Hold on. So, Sean, the queries that you had, uh, those should work with uh, Windows logins as well as the SQL logins, correct? Yes. I, I, I create different logins because I just want to demo it so this way people can see it live. But even though if you use Windows, it will still log. It will still be able to see it. Does that answer your question? Yes, that was uh, the only question. Okay. Okay, no problem. Thank you. Um, uh, we right now. I mean, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, um, uh, the application design. When you create a database, normally your database have two structures. There's a physical structure and there's a logical structure. For your logical structure, it's up to you. But normally, you have to think of normalizations. You have to normalize your OSP database. You have to respect uh, some rules by adding some constraints. And then you, you have to know also um, uh, auto-update statistics is very useful, but not the tool not in every cases because the thing is uh, if you have a very very large database and your table is very very huge when we're talking about tetra database size like 10 or 8 or 3 tetra size of database tetra byte I mean uh, have your auto statistic general can have an impact of to your application. And then remember, don't ever turn on auto uh, shrink. First of all, I don't know why Microsoft still have that. It's true, it helps us uh, retrieve some free space sometimes. But, uh, you know, you retrieve the free space, but your index is very fragmented. And then most of the time, you retrieve it and your database grow at, you know, the same way it was. I mean, it would be better to manage that size um, manually. When it, when it comes uh, to a physical part, on this physical part, you have to take uh, off. You have to look at your rate. Your Transaction log database, which is your LDF file, it would be better to put it on Red 10 because Red 10 is very, very excellent when it comes on to read and write performance. Let's say if you do have uh, like some database where it requires uh, some files like, uh, let's see it as a uh, when you split your database into multiple files, you have your index seat on one file, and then you have your LDF, your MDF seat on another file. I mean, those are the things that it would be better to put that index based on, on your environment, make it sit on top of read file, because read file uh, have much lower write, but that can impact on your performance, you still have to test it. This is uh, my own experience that I'm trying to share. I, I'm not telling you this is exactly how, uh, that's ex exactly the way you should set up your environment, but for some reason, there is the best practices. If you look at, uh, to optimize uh, your IO, parallel, LISMA, it would be better to use 64K or 
256 uh, stripe size uh, because uh, with that it will give you a better performance uh, and then uh, also you have to pick up your disk partition alignment because uh, if, if you don't really correctly implement this partition uh, alignment uh, on each rate that can impact or that can have a significant impact compared to a non-anime disk. You have to test, test your environment also. And then uh, when it comes uh, to like uh, new feature, when I say new feature, there's a lot of new features, especially for 2014. I mean, there's, there are so, there's a lot of new features they say, that will improve your performance. So on my own experience, I have uh, a table that sits uh, on top of a uh, user in memory OLTP where you still have to join to your physical, to another physical server that decreases your performance. Sometimes uh, it, it would be better to know your application and then uh, design a better structure, logic structure for your application because if you don't, there will still you, you you will face some performance issue. Before I continue, is there any questions? Julie? Hello? Okay, it seems like Julie is not here. And then uh, um, let me go to that uh, resource governor. Julie, hello? For the resource go governor, I have a demo, but I don't know if I will have time to do it. Let me ask uh, Julie if I will have time to do it. Jean, we have about five more minutes. Oh, what'd you say, uh, Sharon? I was going to say that he uh, could do his demo. There don't seem to be that many questions. So, Jean, you could uh, continue with your demo. We've got about five minutes left. There aren't any questions uh, remaining. Um, I think it's going to take more than five minutes. It will take at least uh, take to 10 or 12 minutes because I have a test load that I would sh well, I have uh, to load something and show them and prove to them, you know, the beauty of resource governor. It may take at least 15 minutes. Well, if you want to continue, we'll, we'll keep recording and if people have to drop off, they can, but then those who can stay I can continue to watch. Okay. So, uh, okay, that that that's why. Uh, what what I can do uh, on my next uh, demo, I will focus me on that more, because uh, as uh, like I said, uh, I have four minutes left. Let me talk about something else. Then, on my next demo, when I have a chance to present again, and I will. Uh, uh, bring that resource governor. And I will demo that resource governor. Does that make sense? Uh, are you okay with that, uh, Julie? Yeah, that's that's fine. It's it's uh your choice. You know, we can we can continue past the hour if you want. It just depends on what you want to do or present it at another time. Okay, let me present it at another time because uh, you, um, uh, I think I especially um, for me too, and I'm working remotely today, right? So let me um, uh, finish uh, this presentation, and next time I'll be able to demo more when it comes uh, to resource governor and then uh, I will demo some other uh, things we also me about uh, server setting because uh, I don't I, I don't think I will have time to demo 
more than that. Hello, Julie? Yeah, that's fine. Yes, okay, no problem. Thank you. So I will uh, upload uh, um, the presentation and the script uh, and then uh, I will send them to you or what should I do? Yes, if you could just uh, email the scripts to me, I'll get them uploaded to the DBA virtual chapter uh, website. It will be under the archive, meeting archive. Okay. Um, and then I'll also, Jean, I'll also send you, we've got a few more questions and I'll just send them to you um, and you can ask, uh, answer them directly. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. Okay, let me close this. And thank you everybody for attending that session. See you next time. And thank you, Jean, for the presentation today. It was very well received. Uh, we do have quite a few people who were interested in uh, resource governors, so if you have any of those scripts included, uh, they would probably, you know, like those. Yes, I would do that. Okay, as well. And uh, you can work with Sharon uh, on possibly doing another uh, presentation for us. So thanks, Jean, again for the presentation today. Uh, it was well attended and very well uh, received and everybody was is clamoring for the scripts. Yes, I will uh, upload it right now and then uh, for the resource governance script, it's very self-explanatory. It's step by step. They should be able to test it on their own. That sounds great. Thanks again and thank you everybody for joining the DBA virtual chapter meeting today. Okay. Oh, I, I did want to mention that today's raffle winner is Brian Gol Golikiner. Uh He will be receiving a, a $100 Amazon gift card. Uh, this is courtesy of our sponsor, Dell Software. So congratulations, Brian.